Good morning, Revolution. <clears throat> Welcome to Good Morning Revolution, the place where we discuss politics. Good morning, Rosanna. And come on, you guys. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. <laughs> Michael, we can't hear you. Are you muted? No, I'm not muted. Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution. <laughs> well, it's been a big week. It's always a big week. I always say that. Is there such a thing as a small week? I don't know. Um, but a lot of things have been happening. Afghanistan is in the news. And we're going to talk about that. But before we do, we want to talk about a big campaign that the party is undertaking in <clears throat> September. And the campaign is to build the party. Party building campaign, Rosanna. And right. um, I hear you guys got big plans. You're going to recruit big time all across the country. And how do you plan to go about doing it? Well, we, we, uh, <clears throat> our campaign is going to start September 13th. It'll run through December 12th. We plan to have, make available um, quite a few pamphlets that are now being printed. And, but they're also going to be online uh, in a toolkit that's going to be produced to, for comrades to be able to um, <clears throat> uh, you know, print out at a moment's notice if they run out or everything like that. And also to be able to um, email to, to folks that, that perhaps are interested in, in reading it. Um, we'll be holding a how-to webinar that talks about how to talk to people, how to uh, do tabling, some of the do's and don'ts of all of those kinds of things, tabling and marches and, you know, sort of, sort of some of the how-tos, uh, club meetings, things like that. Uh, we're going to look to produce templates of uh, where comrades can just cut and paste um, articles or any kinds of pieces of our materials that they can produce right away uh, and or uh, send out <clears throat> via email because we're still under the COVID restrictions or uh, we have to consider the fact that we're, you know, we're still under all of that so that comrades can immediately disseminate and or share with uh, their coworkers or their family and friends, uh, all of those that we're, we hope to recruit. Um, we'll Sounds be reaching like out. Fun. Yeah, we'll be reaching <laughs> out to everyone. So, you know, we, we hope everybody will uh, join us. And then we also hope to increase our sustainer program, which as we know is uh, vitally needed in terms of the funds. We don't live in a socialist society yet, so we need money. <laughs> in Ohio, how many people y'all going to recruit, Anita? I, I think I, I think I'm going to try to talk my clubs into suggesting that they double their membership. You know, I think double. we could honestly do it. We could each bring in one person that doesn't seem like it's out of range, and we got our supply of the pamphlets on the rural areas, which I think is is one place where we really could. Um, make some headway. We have we have comrades all over Ohio, and I, I'd like to see them empowered with that rural uh, leaflet and the Bill of Rights Socialism leaflet. I think we're going to get some good tabling going as we as we enter this period. Definitely. Well, I hope we're going to rebuild the party in Youngstown, Ohio. If any place yes. you should be able to build it is in my hometown. Mm -hmm. Plus. The right wing is strengthening its grip there, I hear. It doesn't sound good to me. Michael, what about the youth? Are the young people who are going to participate in this campaign or, or what? Yeah, you know, I talked to a few of them about um, what they would envision for um, this campaign. And the first answer I got was, oh, let's double the membership by this time next year. And but start it, you know, in September, as Rosanna was saying. And I was like, oh, my God. And someone said, yeah, how cool would it be to have 20,000? And that sounds kind of far fetched. But if it's like Anita was saying, if Ohio doubles theirs and New York doubles theirs and California and Connecticut and everywhere else doubles, it's really not that far fetched of an idea. And given the circumstances and everything that we're fighting for, and um, I mean, the success of the of the People's World Fund drive uh, in the spring, you know, it's really it, it seems like we could really achieve it. You know, um, people are excited. 
uh, for us running candidates. Um, people are looking for alternatives. They're really disappointed in um, Biden neglecting to uh, cancel student debt as he had promised. They're upset about how the Taliban has taken over. And, um, you know, so I think people are upset and they're looking for alternatives. And so I don't think it's an unrealistic goal uh, to, to aim for. Did you say you had 10,000 members and so you want to double it to 20,000? <laughs> I'm active, active members, members, active members. Yeah. Active members. Oh, uh, well, somebody might ask you to prove that. I mean, people ask me how big is the Communist Party. I always say not big enough. Not, <laughs> not, not nearly. This is a big country with a whole lot of people, uh, Rosanna. You know, uh, but is it just recruiting people? Is that the. No. No, the, the, I wanted to add that it's not just about recruiting people, it's also about activating some of our members that have uh, not been able to be active and finding out and reaching out to them and see, checking in with them to see how they're doing and uh, seeing how they see themselves participating or how they're able to participate. So it's not just about increasing numbers, but also increasing the quality and participation of our membership overall. I read that you want to bring activate thirty percent of the membership. That's the goal. I was wondering how did they arrive at that figure? Thirty thirty percent. That's uh, interesting. <laughs> um, but certainly improving the deepening the involvement is a, will be a big thing. I imagine that's true with respect to social media as well, um, and uh, circulating the press, Anita. That's right. Um, do y'all have a plan? Do y'all circulate People's World articles in uh, Ohio? Yes, we certainly do. We had we had a we were lucky to have a social media intern uh, working with us uh, from Ryerson University in Toronto, um, and she really built up our Twitter um, following. She built up our uh, she built us an Instagram. Uh, she um, we're we're doing Mailchimp now, so. We're really, we beefed up social media and that's what we do mainly on the social media is we take people's world articles that is, especially those that have a special resonance with Ohioans and we get that out into our social media, Instagram, Twitter and, and Facebook. Um, so I think, I think we're, we've really beefed that up and what was the best thing about her work here uh, before she um, was finished with her internship, she established a committee to make sure that uh, the duties that she was carrying out get carried on into the future. So we've got a great social media presence in the uh, in Ohio right now. Oh, that's good to hear, that's good to hear. And the youth, Michael, I mean, uh, you had this big school and uh, are you gonna have additional schools going forward? I imagine part of party building is ideological, deepening the understanding and any thoughts about what that might look like after the school? Yeah, and so we kind of came to the agreement that um, education has to be a constant process in the party, whether it be for new members or members who have been around for a while, you know, to uh, freshen up on, on all this good information and apply it to like um, the struggles that we face every day, because those are often changing, you know what I mean? It's, you know, you don't always know what, what's going to happen three months from now, and so you have to be ready for that. Um, and so the agreement has kind of been, you know, on weekends going forward, we, maybe we can have weekend long schools on Zoom, maybe have classes, you know, here at the building in New York, and then uh, hopefully aim for a, a summer encampment uh, next summer and have it be bigger and have uh, more than, than, you know, 40 or 50 people there, but maybe a couple hundred um, and make it a little bit longer. And so, and, you know, really uh, sit down and break bread and spend, you know, enjoy the summer, play games and, and get that education uh, that we need um, on our own time. And so that's something to look forward to, but it has, it's going to take some planning. You said you want to make it longer. Oh my God. I don't think it was, <laughs> that school was nine continuous days. Roll me out. I can't imagine that, but it could be, or should be longer, but maybe, maybe this first school we said was a, dress rehearsal for the last one. So you guys take it over and and uh, I'll do your thing. But if any problems happen, I don't want to hear about the devil's son. I mean, somebody else, <laughs> somebody else uh, deal with them. But 
building this way is an important part of consolidating the left. Um, Michael and Anita and Rosanna. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a broad left in this country, you know. Um, and uh, but sometimes, uh, and we need unity amongst the left uh, in order to build unity with the center, you know. The bigger the left, the stronger it is, the more working class it is, the, uh, the better for everybody. Um, and uh, but sometimes we get a little confused about uh, who is this left? Is it just Marxist? Is that the left, Rosanna? No, I don't think so. But I think it's it's what's what's being um, put forth, you know, as the left. I think uh, we have to be very, very, very careful because the right is super, super sharp on this question and can use our language to confuse us. And so I think that. Uh, you know, uh, that's one of the things that we, going forward, and it's going to get sharper. So we have to be very, very careful about that. To me, Anita, you look like you wanted to say something. Me? I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think we're really interested in, in uniting the working class, basically. You know, we're, we're really uniting everyone around, um, around certain basic principles and our analysis of, of, of how societies change. So I, I think some groups that talk about uniting the left really have a very, a very narrow view of, of who the left are um, uh, or uh, what it consists of. So I think we have to be, we have to be broad and try to bring people into, into that analysis and, and see, it, see it in that, in that way and have ca class consciousness. Yeah. I think that's an important I was Go gonna ahead, say, Michael. no, I think that's an important point. I, I think that we have to focus on working class unity uh, before we have this, or before we really have that um, envisioned concept of what left unity is, you know, uh, working class unity around issues kind of precedes ideological unity. And so I'm not saying that, you know, we don't work with other groups on the left. I know, you know, we had that inside outside project uh, when Trump was in power. And it was, you know, a coalition with, you know, Freedom Road and DSA, working families and all these other groups. And we kind of agreed, you know, on issues um, and, you know, in terms of like our electoral strategy and so and, and, and so forth. Um, and so I don't think, you know, we're we're against working with others on the left who may not identify as Marxist. You know, some are just progressive people who agree with us on issues and they don't like they don't identify as Marxist. And that's fine. But I think there are many on the left, like Rosanna said, who. Um, that maybe they're kind of reactionary, but they use our language to try to recruit people. But then there also are, you know, on the ultra left, there's people who, you know, maybe they don't identify as Trotskyists or Maoists or whatever, but they're not in touch with um, the day-to-day -day struggles that working people are facing. And that's a big problem because it's confusing young people. Um, and I, th I mean, think about everything that the working class is facing right now. They really need this PRO Act. They really need these this Voting Rights Act, right? And so for these, leftist groups to not be in support of that at a time when that's what the working class needs right now it's the most immediate you know necessity for them I, I just think it shows that they're way out of touch with reality and isolated you know and so th that's a group that we really can't work with it's not that we don't want to it's that we can't because we don't agree on these fundamental issues that are facing our working class right now so wait wait wait, wait. it's kind of a chicken and an egg question you know i mean build working class unity first or build left unity. Don't they both have to be built simultaneously as part of a single process? I mean, um, uh, I mean, how are you going to bring together uh, people in the working class if you can't bring together people in the working class who are on the left first or in the process? I mean, and um, but on the other hand, you're right. Our concept of unity is based on issues. So we can agree on uh, the fight for housing or the fight for universal health care, fight against police violence, fight for immigrant rights, fight for women's rights uh, to choose, for example. Um, then, I mean, that's the basic criteria, you know, for uh, working together. 
but sometimes you have to have a high level of understanding <laughs> Uh, in order to see the need to focus not so much on politics, but on issues uh, in order to bring disparate forces together. Um, so in a certain sense, it's simple, but people are complicated and that makes life more complicated. But when we talk about the left, who are we talking about? We're talking about people who are anti-capitalist, anti-corporate, Right, anti-racist, anti-sexist, you know, pro-worker, pro-people, uh, pro-environment, pro-peace. That's a broad concept of the uh, left. Uh, and so you don't have to be uh, 10 years studying Marx and Lenin and Henry Winston and Claudia Jones and Angela Davis. You, you can just be a person out there who is being radicalized in the in the uh, in the present, some people are radicalized by what happened in Afghanistan last week, and uh, and they want to fight, or they might be radicalized, Rosanna, by the fires that are taking place in your state, Ooh. and the inability of, you know, the government to control it, you know, and 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 therefore uh, they want to, you know, do something about it, uh, and and those are. Uh, our left wing people as uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, but why not bring together all these Marxist Leninist parties? I say parties in quotes. Uh, you know, you got several of them out there. Uh, why not just issue a call? Let's have a convention and uh, work together. All of y'all for socialism. Why are you fighting amongst each other so much? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Michael, Michael? That's, that's, a, that's an interesting concept because I've actually been asked that question before. Some young people, you know, come into the party and they say, oh, how cool would it be if we all got together? And I said, you know, not that I want to give you a history lesson. I'm trained. I'm a trained historian. But a lot of these groups split off of the Communist Party and split off from each other like cell division historically over the issues of tactics and strategy. So it's not that, you know, we're isolating ourselves from them. They split from us and split, 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 split. Um, again, like cell division over tactics and strategy. And again, our tactics and strategy, despite all of our flaws, you know, we never claim to be a perfect organization. We have always been uh, rooted in the working class. I know there's that quote that we often use from Gus about the kite, you know, sometimes it goes to the right, sometimes it goes to the left, but as long as the working class is holding on to it, you're gonna be okay. And I think that's really how we can differentiate ourselves from these other quote unquote Marxist groups on the left is, you know, we were founded, we were founded as, uh, you know, the left wing of, of the Socialist Party, uh, you know, inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution, but fundamentally on the issues, again, here we go with the issues of fighting racism under capitalism. We didn't say we're going to sit around and wait for the revolution to happen to fight racism. Um, and that was interesting. I got in a conversation with someone uh, tabling a few weeks ago who said, well, you guys are kind of a reformist group, right? You guys do elections and you fight for the PRO Act and this and that. Why not revol It's revolution or nothing, right? And I said, you know, what would we look like if we just said, oh, we're going to sit around and wait for a revolution? It's almost an excuse for laziness, you know? And so, of course, we're anti-war. Of course, you'll see us out there uh, protesting, you know, the, the sanctions on Cuba and uh, the bombing of Syria. Uh, but you'll also see us out there, you know, shoulder to shoulder with workers, you know, striking mine workers and uh, with people demanding universal health care, because these are issues that people can unite around and they get radicalized around. You mentioned the fires, you know, California is burning, Greece is burning different parts of the world. And so for us to tell those people, you know, oh, we can't, you know, help you with that because it's revolution or nothing. What does that make us look like? Who are going to win over with that rhetoric? And so that's how I kind of differentiate ourselves. And that's why I think if there was a call made to unite all leftist groups, they may all get together, but they're going to disagree fundamentally on tactics and strategy of how to unite and radicalize workers around these issues on the road to, to revolution, to socialism. Well, Afghanistan is one issue that was in the news this week. And um, I think that uh, one way of approaching this might be to think about what are the main issues now with respect to Afghanistan um, that 
can unite the majority of the uh, of people um, and uh, the American people. And, um, and one of them um, uh, might be how they're handling uh, the issues of the withdrawal. By the way, how do y'all think, uh, if you're on a scale of one to 10, how do you think that the administration has handled the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan? 10 being great, one uh, being terrible. So, Anita? I'd give him a B minus, I guess, maybe seven. Because I, I think he Biden ripped off the Band-Aid and it was never going to be pretty, but he ended a, an imperialist war that had to end. And um, maybe if, if he had if uh, his administration had made better plans to get people out really fast, it would have looked like such a condemnation of our own 20 years there that we knew that the government was not going to hold up very long. So I think, um, you know, I think there was a lot of things in the balance there, but I think we do have a um, a, a, a a responsibility as uh, you know, since we had been in there, uh, the United States had been in there for 20 years and had you know infiltrated life there and created different relationships among people there. I think we owe it to Afghans who want to um, leave, who who our presence have have put in danger in that in that situation. I think we ought to get them out of there and, you know, get them to the United States. And, um, you know, I, uh, I understand that Columbus is due to, to receive more refugees because this is one city that um, really has received a lot of refugees in the past and is gearing up to receive some more. So I think that and, and, and I think people won't. Um, I mean, the, the overwhelming majority of people in the United States wanted us to leave Afghanistan and and we are doing that. And I think that's a, probably a good thing in the long run. And rightfully so. Uh, so you go to the seven, Asana, <laughs> 10 good, I, one terrible, withdrawal. I don't think, I don't think it's so easy to just rate it in, in under, with numbers because it's so complicated. You know, it's super complicated to say, oh, yeah, you did the right thing and or, oh, no, you should have done it this way. I mean, hindsight, you know, can say, well, yeah, maybe this way should have been better or that way should have not been better. I personally feel like <clears throat> let's get the hell out of there simply because we have to leave the people of Afghanistan to to determine their own path, to fight for their own rights. And to and to live, you know, a life, <clears throat> and to establish a life of, uh, you know, uh, that is free from our intervention and free from our our uh, control. Um, and I think that that you know, from from what I have seen and and read, <clears throat> the Taliban is not going to. Um, it's not the same Afghanistan that they had 20 years ago. And there's a lot of talk about that. And, and you know, uh, and so they're having to even, uh, uh, they have world pressure on them that they've already said, oh no, women will go to school. And I mean, there's certain things that they're already sort of uh, uh, having to state because the world is watching and the world is, is pressure is putting this pressure on them. Not to say that things are not are going to be great for for people. I don't know. I don't live there. I have never been to Afghanistan to say yes or not. But I think that you know we don't have any business there. And I think the American people are seeing first and foremost how we had no business there for twenty years. Secondly, the amount of money that that was spent there. It's our tax dollars, and I don't think people understand that this money isn't coming out of the air. It's our tax dollars that are being spent there for this, for this, when our infrastructure is falling apart, when our children are going hungry, when there are homeless people everywhere throughout the country, people are, are dying and all of that, when we could provide you know, the means for, for uh, our own people here, you know, we don't have any business in other, other people's countries. We have to take care of our business here. 
And so uh, our tax dollars should go to this, not to uh, just cause, you know, it's like, it's like somebody coming into my house and taking over, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, so no vote. So I don't have a number. <laughs> no number. No number. Oh. Good. Abstaining. Michael, <laughs> 10, good. One, terrible. What's your vote? I'm going to say a five, which if this was a, at a school, you know, it'd be 50%. That's still an F. But, but the thing is, is I think, you know, from Carter, Reagan, Bush number one, Clinton, you know, it, we've been involved in Afghanistan since the late 70s. By we, I mean the United States government. And it just hasn't been pretty. But we have been demanding of all of these uh, presidential administrations that we pull out. Um, I remember the the first demonstration I ever went to when I was young, I think it was seven or eight, and it was a anti-war demonstration in Washington, DC with my parents. And we just happened along it. You know, we were we were touring or whatever, and we we went to the rally. And it changed my life because then it, it kind of got me thinking, you know, what why should we not be there? And this or that. And then you start learning more about the Muhajideen and how the United States funded it to, you know, overthrow socialism, this and that. And I just, I came across these numbers. And I think this is why, again, like Anita was saying, there was no perfect way to do it. We had been demanding from Bush number two all the way to, to Biden now to remove the troops. And so we can't complain that they're gone, but uh, we should have never been there in the first place. And this is the wreck that was caused. And so 1% of the money wasted on the war in Afghanistan could end homelessness in the USA. That's a fact from uh, Code Pink. 7% of the money wasted on the war in Afghanistan could cancel all medical debt. And 16.5% of the money wasted on the war in Afghanistan could end world hunger by 2030. And so that just gives you a scale. The next time we say, we hear, you know, oh, we can't have universal health care. We can't have free college tuition. It's, it's bull crap. We can have it. We can afford a war like this. We can t definitely afford all these things for, for our working people. That's right. Well, we got a seven. We got a no contest. <laughs> and we got a five. My vote minus three. <laughs> minus, I think they handled it terribly, almost from every angle. <laughs> I'm sorry. They started by saying that, oh, boasting, oh, that we got a strong army there, we trained them, we have. This is Mr. Biden a month ago. And uh, how could they not know? They knew that the corruption was deep and systemic and that the military and police so-called were gonna, they didn't support, the people didn't support the government. And, uh, and uh, cause it was a puppet, you know, mm -hmm. imposed government. And uh, not that they supported the Taliban, but I mean, have mercy. <clears throat> and so they should have recognized that and handled it in a, a better way. Well, that does it. For this week, um, what's your vote? If we don't have a poll, we should do polls and people mm -hmm. can, can write in and, and let us know what uh, they think. So we wrote an editorial on it, it's at cpusa.org. Everybody should go there, check it out, read, and we'll be back next week. Until then, stay safe, stay strong, stay in the fight. Have a great week, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.